I'm delighted to tell you about some work we've been doing uh, with iPS-derived stem cells. And, and this really started as work trying to use stem cells as a model to understand specific diseases, uh, especially Alzheimer's disease that I'll tell you a bit today about. Um, but in doing this, we, we started doing a lot of transplantation experiments that I'm going to describe and started to think about these cells uh, uh, in a sort of therapeutic uh, um, uh, avenue as well, that maybe we could use a transplantation approach for certain diseases. So uh, a couple disclosures. Uh, my lab does have some sponsored research from uh, a few different biotech companies. And, and fairly recently, I co-founded a, a company with some colleagues on the concept of, of transplanting um, human microglia. So I'm going to kind of break this down into two parts. I'm going to start with, with telling you about how we got into this. We developed approaches to, to generate microglia from iPS cells and how we've been using that to study Alzheimer's disease with a specific focus on some of the risk genes that drive this disease. Um, and then I'm going to kind of switch gears to some of this newer unpublished work on how we're thinking about harnessing um, uh, microglia as a sort of a therapeutic delivery vehicle to the central nervous system. So first, a, a little bit of an introduction on, on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you probably, many of you know that Alzheimer's disease is the most common uh, cause of age-related dementia, and it, and it gradually destroys a person's memory and ability to, to reason and learn and communicate and, and eventually even just carry out daily activities. And uh, there's a lot of pathology occurring in Alzheimer's disease. We'll talk a little bit about the key hallmark pathologies. But ultimately, those pathologies combine to cause massive loss of neuron neurons, their connections, the synapses, um, which you can see here. And this sort of on the right side is, uh, is an Alzheimer's brain and an equivalent age match brain on the left. And that's an important point. Alzheimer's disease is not a natural phenomena of aging. You can age quite healthy without developing uh, dementia. This is actually a disease process. Um, and yet, it's, it's quite common. About 10% of uh, people over the age of 65 are starting to show signs of, of Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, it's not going away. It's actually getting worse. And this is largely because of our demographics, our population, both in the US and worldwide, is, is aging. Um, and so age is one of the biggest risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And so as our population ages, the uh, uh, amount of Alzheimer's disease we're going to continue to see is going to increase. There have been some, uh, pro some progress with, with therapeutic development for Alzheimer's disease, things like monoclonal antibodies to try and target some of the pathologies. But you know, I think most in the field would agree that the, the benefits are relatively subtle. They just slightly slow down. Uh, the decline, we don't know for how long, but they also come with some pretty serious uh, side effects. And so there's a real need to better understand this disease and hopefully use that information to develop uh, other therapeutic approaches. So in terms of the pathology, we've known for over 100 years since Aloha Alzheimer first described the pathology uh, that he saw in, in a case, that there are two kind of hallmark pathologies, amyloid plaques, which are shown here, they're um, insoluble aggregates of a protein called beta amyloid that accumulates extracellularly. And then neurophobic tangles, which are aggregates of a different protein. It's called tau. It's a microtubule binding protein that's expressed in neurons. It becomes hyperphosphorylated and insoluble, leading to tangles. And really, the tangles is the most proximal to the cell death. Uh, tangles and the accumulation of tau is what's driving a lot of that neuronal loss that one sees later in the disease. That's accompanied by uh, what we used to kind of just call inflammation, which is a very nondescript term. Um, and what I hope I'm going to leave you with at the end of the day is there's lots of types of inflammation. There's lots of different ways that immune cells can respond to pathologies, some of which may be beneficial. Um, but this was called inflammation because when, when we peered down a microscope, we would see examples as depicted here. So the blue here is an amyloid plaque. And the red are microglia surrounding that plaque. And you may even just about be able to see a little blue dot in a couple of these cells that are examples of uh, microglia that have now phagous toes and tried to clear some of this amyloid. It's clear when we look at these sections from Alzheimer's patients, though, that they're inefficient at doing that. They're trying to get rid of this amyloid, but they're, they're inefficient. Um, but 
the assumption has been that this process is, is bad and contributing to the further development of dementia. And I think we're learning a lot about this process and that perhaps this response may actually be protective. And I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, all of these pathologies collectively end up leading to neuronal and synaptic loss. And, and ultimately, that's what correlates best with dementia. That was actually really elegant work done in the 80s by uh, Eliza Masley and Bob Terry here at UCSD showing that when you quantify all these different pathologies, synapse loss cor uh, correlates the best with, with this dementia. So we've learned a lot about the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. And to begin with, the genetics really focused on rare forms of Alzheimer's, familial, dominantly inherited forms of Alzheimer's disease. And those really pointed towards beta amyloid because those mutations were occurred in the precursor protein that gives rise to amyloid and two of the enzymes that help to cut and liberate amyloid from that precursor protein. And, and that led to this, this concept, the amyloid cascade hypothesis, that amyloid is sort of the most upstream driving cause of this disease. But that really was accounting for only about 3% of Alzheimer's cases that had those dominant familiar mutations. We knew there were some other risk factors, things like APOE that were discovered um, uh, now probably about 30 years ago. Um, but more recently, with the advent of genome-wide association studies, a lot more genes have been identified to help to explain this phenomenon that we did know about, which is that Alzheimer's disease is still highly heritable. And I'm talking about the other 97% is still highly heritable. Uh, it's about 60% genetic, but it's a polygenic disorder. It involves interactions potentially between multiple genes that are influencing the risk. And that was really most elegantly showed by these twin studies, that if you had identical twins and one had Alzheimer's, the other had about a 60% chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. Step forward a few decades, and we now have uh, data pointing towards loci that are linked to this risk, um, and subsequent follow-up studies that have tried to identify what genes are associated with that linkage. And when those genes are mapped and we start to ask just a very simple question about what cells in the brain express high levels of those mRNAs, uh, we, you can see we get this kind of data. So here in the heat map, red is high and blue is low. And here's a, a set of these, some of the first initial GWAS genes that were identified. And we're looking across a, a RNA sequencing database at uh, astrocytes, uh, endothelial cells, microglia, neurons and oligodendrocytes, and you can hopefully see that a good three quarters of those genes are most highly expressed in microglia, suggesting their effects may be mediated via altering microglial function. So a little bit about microglia, and I'm gonna spend, well, not a little bit, I'm gonna spend the rest of the, rest of the time talking about microglia, but a little bit of an introduction to microglia for, for those of you who aren't as familiar. Um, so microglia are the resonant immune cell of the brain, and so they are important for immune surveillance. Uh, so if you were to get exposed to bacteria and, and a, a virus in your brain, essentially getting meningitis, your, your microglia are gonna be the first responders and trying to protect you from that. But fortunately, our brain is quite well protected already by the blood-brain barrier. And so microglia don't typically have to do too much of their immune surveillance job. And I think evolution doesn't like to waste energy, so it's turned to these cells and said, well, what else can we use them for? And uh, microglia have evolved to do a lot of other really important functions uh, within the brain that are not necessarily uh, directly related to immune surveillance. So they're important in neuronal homeostasis. They can provide growth factors, for example, to neurons. Uh, there's a, a growing amount of evidence that Microglia play a role in synaptic plasticity, so not only can they sometimes promote certain synapses by providing growth factors, but they also play an important role in the pruning of synapses that are no longer necessary. And this is something that seems to go quite wrong in a number of diseases, Alzheimer's disease, neuropsychiatric diseases, for example. Um, uh, they've also been shown to be involved in the turnover of myelin. It turns out that our uh, white matter myelinated axons do, that myelin gets old, needs to be replaced, and in order to replace it, you need to clear it out. Microglia play a really important role in that clearance of that myelin, and that becomes even more important when you have a disease such as multiple sclerosis where you have problems with myelination. Um, and then uh, if cells die, either in development or, for example, adult neurogenesis, you kind of get an overproduction of cells. 
Um, those dyed cells are cleared uh, by microglia. In fact, Greg Lemke uh, at the Salk showed, showed some beautiful work on the process by which microglia do that. Um, and then microglia can also clear or try to clear extra aggregates such as beta amyloid. And then probably the most recent finding is, uh, and, and we've shown some work on this along with several others, that the microglia may actually play an important role in maintaining the blood brain barrier. So this is all great, and we can turn to our mouse models and, and manipulate specific microglia genes and learn a lot about these, um, uh, the function of microglia in the mammalian brain. But it turns out when you look at these Alzheimer's risk genes, the homology is quite variable. So this is just a, a heat map showing the relative homology at the amino acid sequence of uh, uh, some of the uh, initial sets of Alzheimer's GLUS genes. And so these genes in, in the green, the dark greens, have very good homologies, meaning that if you study these in a traditional mouse model, likely it's going to be quite indicative of what you would be seeing in a human microglia. But as you get into these lighter and darker blues, the homology gets poorer and poorer. And in fact, some of these Alzheimer's risk genes really don't have an appropriate murine homologue. And so if you want to understand the function of some of those genes, you're going to have to take uh, more dramatic approaches. Maybe you're going to need to humanize a mouse uh, at the genetic level or study human cells. And so around the time that this was being discovered, I had been working on stem cell work, primarily related to neural stem cell modeling and transplantation uh, work, in fact, some of the work inspired by, by some uh, Evans uh, work years ago and, and Gene's work. Um, but I started to think, well, it would be really helpful to start to study human microglia in order to understand these genes. And I was actually kind of surprised when I turned to PubMed that there had not yet been developed an approach to differentiate pluripotent stem cells into microglia. So the thought was, could we uh, isolate fibroblasts or PBMCs from uh, Alzheimer's or control patients, generate um, reprogramming them into iPS cells, and then differentiate them into microglia. And this last step, uh, turned out, was not yet solved. Um, fortunately, I had a, a very talented um, graduate student at the time, Abdul Aboud, who uh, I, we talked and I said, this is going to be a challenging project. It may totally fail. It's not a great project for a PhD, but uh, those of you who know Edsel know he's, he's a really hard worker and, and ambitious, and he went for it, and I'm sure glad he did because he worked it out. So um, what he did is what a lot of us stem cell researchers will do when we need to develop a, a cell, new cell type, new differentiation approach, is to study development, learn from development, what is the origin of those cells, what are the cues that drive those cells. And so there's actually been some, some really elegant lineage tracing studies in mouse models about the origin of microglia. They, they actually arise very early in development from the yolk sac, from what we call primitive hemopoietic progenitors. These are really the very, very first blood cells that start to develop. Those start to differentiate into a, a cell type called erythroid myelite progenitor that then migrates into the brain while it's developing. The blood brain barrier then forms, kind of trapping those cells in the brain, and the brain environment actually helps to do the rest to allow those cells to eventually become microglia. And for the most part, throughout our life, our microglia just maintain their numbers through uh, self-renewal. The estimate is in humans, our complement of microglia turnover about every four years. Um, you typically get very, other, very few other myeloid cells coming into the brain beyond that initial infiltration during development unless you have pretty severe diseases. Things like multiple sclerosis, you can have recruitment of other cells, not just T cells, but other myeloid cells uh, to the brain. So those other myeloid cells are coming from the more traditional, uh, well-studied route of bone marrow hemopoietic stem cells. And those are what we call definitive hemopoietic stem cells. They give rise to our T cells, our B cells, NK cells, and also monocytes that then, when they enter different tissues, can become macrophages. And again, for the most part, those don't actually enter into the brain. They don't cross the blood brain barrier unless you have a pretty severe injury. At that point, they can get into the brain and act a little bit like microglia. Uh, but if there's time permitting, I'll show you, they, they never quite really become microglia. So they are, I, I like to think of them as second cousins, uh, peripheral macrophages and microglia. Uh, 
So what Edsel did was to look at this uh, lineage tracing studies, look at some of the growth factors that have been identified as driving some of this differentiation, and a lot of trial and error, as many of you familiar with the stem cell research uh, field would know, but essentially his entire thesis is summed up in, in one little figure here. <laughs> um, uh, uh, he, along with, and this is typical of science, along with many other groups around that same time, uh, developed approaches to differentiate microglia uh, from iPS cells. But essentially, all of, our, all of the groups tried to mimic that developmental ontogeny of those primitive hemopoietic progenitors, and then, in our case, moving those primitive progenitors into a new set of media that mimics that brain environment, provides growth factors that we know are really important for the survival and maturation of microglia. It's about a 42-day protocol to get a mature microglia, but you can actually do a lot of experiments already after about 14, 15 days. They're already quite well on their way to microglia. The other nice thing is it's highly pure protocol. Essentially, uh, 98 to 100 percent of the cells are going to be microglia from this protocol. So, uh, you know, the first thing uh, we needed to do, of course, is if we were going to call them microglia, we better show that they're microglia. And so Edsel did a number of studies to, to try and validate these cells, so including uh, transcriptional studies here, bulk sequencing, and the, the PCA here is looking at a number of different myeloid cell types. So here's our positive controls of adult and fetal human microglia. Uh, the blue are what we call the IMGLs, IPS microglia-like. I've subsequently dropped that L, and I'll show you why in a minute. Um, uh, here are their cousins, the blood monocytes in the periphery, and here, of course, are the starting IPS cells. And you can see that they're very closely aligned in that three-dimensional space with the positive control. Now, some of you may be noticing that it, I've got cultured underlined here. These are human microglia isolated from the brain that were cultured, and I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Um, functionally, these cells act like microglia. They can phagocytose typical brain substrates. In this case, this is fibril amyloid that they're eating, and, and in this case, we've, we're looking at a manipulation of a specific gene. They can produce cytokines and chemokines in response to various inflammatory stimuli. Um, we can also transplant them into brain organoids. So brain organoids, most of the traditional methods for generating organoids are neuroectodermal, do not include microglia, but you can actually quite easily seed those organoids with microglia and they'll migrate in and start to further mature as if they had been put in a brain environment. And of course, Rusty Gage here has sort of taken that to the next step by taking these microglial organoids and then putting them back into a, a mouse model to be able to study that in vivo. And then they also will show typical chemotaxis to, to microglial specific cues. So in this case, ADP is a very strong chemotactic cue for microglia. So we think we have microglia. What can we do with them? Well, we've done a lot of studies, and I, I'm going to really briefly uh, go through you know, one example in, in really one slide, because I really want to get into some of our in vivo work. But this is work led primarily by Amanda McQuaid with some, some recent data that Johnny Hausman's generated that's related to this, um, asking, using these cells to ask this question, can we use these to study an Alzheimer's risk gene? And so we decided to uh, start with the low-hanging fruit, which is a gene called TREM2. It's a, gene that is highly expressed in microglia and really no other cell type in the brain. Um, and mutations in this increase Alzheimer's risk by about threefold. Those mutations, there was also evidence suggesting that they were partial loss of function. So we were just starting to get started with CRISPR editing of iPS cells. And those of you who do CRISPR know it's way easier to make a knockout than to correct. So that was the first thing we did. Um, and we knocked out this TREM2 in three different human IPS lines. And this is just the protein validation of this. And then did, you know, sort of the bread and butter simple questions. Well, what's different in terms of microglial gene expression when you knock this out? And lo and behold, there's a lot of gene expression changes. We looked at the ontology of those, and those pointed us towards certain functional assays that might uh, be affected in these cells. And sure enough, we found that the knockouts had an impairment in phagocytosis. So for example, impaired clearance of beta amyloid. Perhaps that's part of how this TREM2 mutation contributes to Alzheimer's disease. Um, they also show uh, some differences in terms of gene expression. And this is new data. Turns out these microglia, although they are very pure, 
and have all the typical microglial markers, even in a dish, they show heterogeneous different subtypes of cells by gene expression. And this is very consistent with what one actually sees in the brain, that microglia kind of can come in different flavors and respond to different brain environments. And we can even see that in the dish. And in this case, looking at our TREM2 knockout versus our wild type, there are a number of different genes that are upregulated or downregulated with, with various functional implications. But along comes Chris Glass <laughs> to rain on my parade. Uh, so just as we were kind of getting ready and we were working through our revisions of, the, of our paper, uh, this really elegant paper came out from, from Chris's lab. And uh, Chris and, and Nicole are some of the few people who are able to isolate human microglia from human brains, be it maybe if I, from patients with intractable epilepsy and they're having to have a surgical resection. They get a little bit of tissue from the uh, surgery room, and then they can isolate human microglia. And what, what they asked was, how similar are those microglia uh, in terms of their gene expression uh, when you have just very quickly isolated from the brain versus now cultured them. And what this clearly shows, the ex vivo is straight out of the brain, RNA isolated. Within even just six hours, the gene expression of these microglia is substantially changing. And by 24 hours, it's kind of stabilized, but it's very, very different. And uh, uh, these cells seem to look quite similar to those cultured IPS microglia. So if you remember, I highlighted that those were cultured cells I was comparing them to. <laughs> so what does that mean? Well, how useful is studying a cell on the dish versus in the brain? It depends what you're doing. I think we all would agree that almost everything you find in vitro would be nice to validate in vivo if you can. Um, but that really kind of inspired me. So in addition to raining on my parade, it kind of inspired me to, to try another experiment, which was to ask if we could transplant our IPS microglia into a mouse brain to sort of provide a surrogate brain environment to see will that promote more of this ex vivo human microglial brain signature. So the idea here was to kind of, again, mimic developmental ontogeny, taking these progenitors that normally migrate into the brain and put them into a young mouse, uh, mouse pup. Now, we of course have to use a pretty specialized mouse. The mouse needs to be immune deficient so it won't reject human cells. And um, we kind of learned the hard way after trial and error that we also had to have a mouse that had a humanized form of this gene, CSF1. CSF1 is a growth factor that is really critical for microglial survival. And it turns out the mouse version of, of that ligand doesn't bind the human receptor appropriately. And so if you put them into a normal mouse, the, the human microglia basically starved to death. But in this mouse where the human version has been knocked in, the human microglia can survive. So how do they survive? Well, this is, was actually one of our first uh, sections we looked at two months after transplantation. And I was, I was uh, thrilled to look down the microscope and see this kind of level of engraftment. So the green here, each of these little dots is, is a human microglia. Um, Morgan Coburn and Johnny, the two grad students working on this at the time, um, had transplanted directly into the forebrain at a couple sites of these pups. Those cells had then proliferated, migrated, started to fill in the brain near the injection site. But we actually know that microglia are very good at regulating their numbers. And so the advantage here was that we did this in a young pup that didn't have a full brain full of microglia. And that allowed our human microglia to proliferate and take over a lot of this niche. But by the time those microglia started to get back here to the hindbrain and forebrain, away from where we transplanted, the mouse microglia had now grown up and filled up the space. So we couldn't get them in that part. I was still fine with that because we were studying Alzheimer's disease, which is the action is really in the forebrain. So we thought this might be a helpful model. We went on to, to validate that these cells morphologically become much more equivalent to a brain microglia. They become highly ramified. They have all of the typical what we call homeostatic microglia markers, such as P2RY12, um, uh, as well as nuclear transcription factors. And we can get about 70 to 80% chimerism in those four brain regions. So we also wanted to see if they functionally uh, may be um, equivalent. And so we teamed up with, with a colleague to do some multifocal imaging of mice that we transplanted with GFP-labeled microglia. 
And microglia, just when they're in a normal, healthy brain, will sort of undergo this, this surveillance, where they're just kind of checking out the local area, trying to make sure everything's OK. And you can probably see that the cell bodies are not moving, but there's these little tiny processes that are kind of moving. And this is actually work that, that was first pioneered by Axel and Imerjohn. Um, there's another approach one can ask, which is, which is how do these cells respond if you now give an insult? And the way to do that with multiphoton is to do a very strong intensity uh, laser ablation of a specific area and then to image how those microglia respond. And so you can see here, and I'll repeat, the laser injury is happening right in the middle, and very quickly you have these processes from these human microglia converging on that injury. And when we quantify this, it's, it's quite equivalent in terms of rates uh, of movement to uh, endogenous mouse microglia. So it looks like these cells are not only looking like microglia, but they're, they're acting like microglia. So if you remember, part of the inspiration here was Chris's study in trying to understand would putting them in this brain environment make this more ex vivo signature. So we actually teamed up with, with Chris and Nicole to compare their data sets, get additional samples uh, to our data sets. And so this is bulk RNA sequencing, looking at a whole bunch of different myeloid cells here. So the one all on their own, lonely over here, are human blood monocytes, right? These are the second cousins, I like to say, of microglia. Up here at the top, we have these uh, human brain-derived microglia that have been cultured for seven days. So this, this sort of uh, group of data from Chris's lab, but also some similar samples that we generate in our lab. In yellow here are IPS microglia. And what we're trying to go for are these green samples. These are the ex vivo human brain samples. Now, you might be looking at this saying, well, you're pretty, pretty well on your way here with these IPS microglia. And I, I think that's true. And, and it's sort of surprising. Why would an IPS microglia be more like a brain microglia than these cultured human microglia? Uh, and I think it really just comes down to, to media. So we had discovered that TGF beta is very important for maintaining this homeostatic signature. And I think that pushes them a little more towards where we wanted to go. But those of you who do RNA sequencing know that these PCAs can be a little tricky because they are very influenced by contrast. So here we have this guy as a contrast, pushing all the microglia off to one side, making them look similar. But we can very easily just take the same data and remove that monocyte contrast. And now we get a better spread of our remaining microglial cells. You can even, for example, see lab-dependent differences in transcriptome between these two sets of samples. Now the IPS microglia are sort of on their own, still along the main PC1, on their way a little more to these human brain-derived microglia. But importantly, now that we're really being sort of harsh on ourselves, the transplanted human microglia, which are shown in purple, that we've pulled back out of the mouse brain, are still overlapping very nicely with these uh, human ex vivo microglia. So I, we, we do think that transplanting them into the surrogate environment helps to push them towards a cell that is much more like a human microglia and a human brain. So what about Alzheimer's disease? This is why we got into this. And those of you familiar with Alzheimer's disease and microglia have probably heard this term DAM, uh, which stands for disease-associated microglia. Uh, for some reason, the Alzheimer's field has gotten really into acronyms, three-letter acronyms. So there are now CAMS, BAMS, SAMS, LAMS. Am I missing any, Nicole? <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, all different types of microglia, essentially. But anyway, DAM was the first one. Um, and it came from some single cell sequencing studies of a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. What they found was that microglia weren't all just hom homogeneous. They had some different sort of gene expression signatures. And this one signature was much more prevalent in an Alzheimer's model than a wild type mouse. When they then correlated those genes with their location in the brain, they found that that DAM signature uh, was essentially in the microglia that were surrounding the plaques, as, as shown here. So the DAM signature is a plaque responsive signature from these Alzheimer's mice. Um, so we, of course, wanted to know would human microglia adopt a DAM signature? Um, so we took our, our uh, uh, model, our base model, crossed it in with this 5X FAD model, the same model used in this original paper that develops a lot of plaque pathology. Those of you who work with mice will sympathize because this first time, this was a mouse that had five uh, 
uh, homozygous genes required for the transplantation plus one heterozygous gene, and we had to restore all of those to homozygosity to get the mouse. We're now down to three, which is a lot easier, but it took a while. Um, but we transplanted some mice, wait, let them age for the plaque pathology to, to develop, looked at the brains, and this is what we saw. So we used a GFP expressing microglia so we could very easily trace them. And you can probably see they're sort of scattered around the brain, but there's, there's a lot of these brighter spots here. When we zoom in on those spots, those are really quite adjacent to the amyloid plaque shown in, in white here, and you can see that at the higher power view. And you can also see this marker CD9, it's a tetraspan, and it's also an exosome marker, um, that is, seems to be really enriched in those microglia, but only the ones that are close to the plaques. CD9, it turned out, was one of these dam genes that have been identified. And so sure enough, here was our first evidence that human microglia might be able to become dams. They might be able to change this gene expression, at least in terms of this one gene, CD9. So of course, we wanted to take a little more unbiased approach. So we turned to single cell sequencing of, of either wild type or 5X version of these mice. And we saw, as we expected, a, an increase in this cluster that, that had a lot of these dam genes. Um, but when we actually looked at the content of those genes and compared it to the mouse genes that have been previously reported, the, the overlap was fairly limited. About 10 to 12 percent of the genes actually overlapped. So CD9, yes, certainly overlapped, as did TREM2, but there were a lot of differences between the human and the mouse dam signature. And so I think that was sort of further evidence to us that, uh, of the importance of studying human microglia and human microglia in vivo uh, if you're interested in studying Alzheimer's disease. I should say that subsequently, people have looked for dams through single nuclei sequencing of human AD tissue, and what they're finding is it is different from the mouse, and actually our signature we're seeing here maps onto the human data a lot better than the, the typical transgenic mouse microglia dam data. So we can now also use these mice to, to ask questions about some of these Alzheimer's risk genes. So Amanda uh, turned back to her TREM2 that she'd been studying in vitro, transplanted those same cells into some mice, and waited a little while uh, to see how they might respond to amyloid. And what we found, and you can hopefully see this here, is that the wild type are clustered around the amyloid plaques in red, whereas the TREM2 knockouts don't seem to be paying the same amount of attention. They're not really recognizing there's a problem in the same way. And you see about half as much proximity to those plaques. Um, now, if you remember, TREM2 partial loss of function mutations increase Alzheimer's risk. And so our knockout should be mimicking this increased risk, and we're seeing this decreased, quote unquote, inflammation. So this harkens back to, to one of my first slides where this data with TREM2 from us and, and other groups is, I think, some of the first data to really suggest that this is actually a protective response. This quote unquote, inflammation of microglia surrounding plaques is actually a way to protect the brain. And in fact, subsequent studies have shown that when you have this, you have less secondary neuronal damage in response to those plaques. If we look by single cell sequencing at these, these mice, we find that essentially that dam cluster has just almost completely disappeared in the TREM2 knockout mice, which, which makes sense because it's related to proximity to this plaques. It's induced by amyloid. They're not there to be induced by amyloid. We've gone on to, to develop a more comprehensive model, an even crazier uh, crossed mouse, a Frankenstein mouse that develops amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, um, uh, which we think is very important for Alzheimer's disease. Those are the two hallmark pathologies, and the tangles are really more proximal to cell death. In this model, we can transplant, and we, we're seeing some quite interesting data where the combined pathology leads to a further exacerbation, even the appearance of, of new clusters of microglia, uh, including some more pro-inflammatory ones that may actually be detrimental. Um, so that work's ongoing, and, and I just wanted to introduce that we're continuing to do these studies with mouse models of Alzheimer's disease and manipulating different Alzheimer's risk genes to understand how they affect microglial function and the hope is that perhaps we can learn what is the general type of microglia we want to encourage to reduce Alzheimer's, and ideally are there pharmacological approaches to encourage that, that phenotype. So just to summarize this, this first part about Alzheimer's disease, 
we can make large numbers of these, these microglia, highly pure, fully defined approach, and we can use them to study Alzheimer's risk genes, but actually many groups have adopted our protocols and started to study many other diseases, Parkinson's, ALS, uh, uh, schizophrenia, et cetera. Um, when we mature these cells in the surrogate brain environment, it promotes this more ex vivo brain-like signature, and I think is, is important for being able to really study the in vivo activity of human microglia and be able to manipulate that, which we obviously can't do in, in human patients. Um, and then I showed you just a little bit of data from our CHEM2 studies that are, that are published, but um, showing that reduction in CHEM2 expression leads to this impairment and this sensing and migration to plaques and loss of this adoption of this disease associated with microglial state, and that that is actually um, increasing Alzheimer's risk. And then, as I mentioned, we're doing a number of other studies looking at other AD risk genes in these, these models. So I just want to... So the last part, the rest of the talk, I wanted to tell you about, um, I think all of the rest is, is unpublished at this point, um, but how we're starting to think about these cells as a potential therapeutic vehicle. And you've seen a few of these pictures of, of how well these cells seem to engraft in the brain and how well they can migrate. And that makes sense. Microglia are programmed to sense and respond to pathologies and cues. They're very chemotactic cells. And so I got to thinking, well, a lot of cell therapies that have been developed have been off the idea of providing something that's missing, whether it be a lysosomal enzyme or a neurotrophin that we don't have enough of. Um, and so delivery, of course, is a major hurdle for brain diseases. And I got to thinking, well, maybe microglia are a good way to deliver these things. So we've done a few experiments to try and start to test that out. So, uh, just a little bit of background on cell transplantation. We've got some pioneers in this room here who, who uh, you know, inspired a lot of this uh, uh, work on cell therapies for neurological diseases. And I think most of us would, would agree um, that it's probably ideal to use a cell that kind of belongs in the brain, ideally maybe can even integrate within the brain appropriately. Um, you might want a cell that's really good at migrating and sensing and responding to to pathologies and injuries. Um, you might want a cell that you can have deliver even, either an endogenous cargo or genetically modify to help facilitate delivery of a, of a uh, specific cargo, so be it a neurotrophin, a single chain antibody, et cetera. But ultimately, the most important thing, the thing the FDA most cares about is this, which is you want to have something that is gonna be ideally long lasting, um, but especially you want it to be safe. You don't want to uh, have tumors developing from your therapy. Um, and I actually learned that the hard way just as I was starting my independent lab. I've been working on neural stem cell approaches for Alzheimer's disease and had teamed up with a, a company that was moving forward with, with clinical development of a neural stem cell approach. And we had some preliminary data that looked really encouraging. And we got a nice CIRM grant to fund some studies to look at their GMP grade uh, cells instead of their research grade cells that we'd used before. So we did some transplants into our mouse model of Alzheimer's, um, and I'm lucky that I had a, a very thorough, very careful grad student at the time leading that project, because he looked at every single section of those mouse, mice, and in about a quarter of them, right at the most rostral aspect of the brain, he found these things here. Which, so this is right as the lateral ventricle is almost disappearing, and we saw these clusters of cells, and the black here is a marker for human nuclei. Clearly, they were human cells. It's now in green in the fluorescent here. And these are a number of different markers showing a mixture of um, uh, glial and neuronal genes that really shouldn't be coexisting that much. And we even saw evidence of these cells starting to uh, infiltrate the, the adjacent striatum. Uh, so I kind of freaked out and called my collaborators at the, at the company. Uh, long story short, they threatened to sue me. <laughs> uh, if I called them tumors in the title, you can see who won that battle because we called them ectopic clusters. Uh, but those of you who are neurologists would probably agree that a big lump of cells in your lateral ventricle is not going to be uh, benign. Um, so that's the worst case scenario. And obviously, uh, there's experts in the room who know how important differentiation is and having the cells really characterized appropriately. And I think 
I would say that these GMP cells that they provided were not characterized appropriately. In contrast, we've now done a lot of transplants with these IPS microglia. We're, we're over 1,000 now, and that's in genetically immune deficient mice, which is sort of the ideal model to get a tumor because there's no immune response to it. And we've never seen even the slightest evidence for a neoplasm. We've taken these mice out to 16 months um, and, you know, used lots of different lines. I think we're up to about 20 IPS-derived microglia in there. And we even don't see any other differentiation of any other cell type besides microglia. So they look to be very safe. And it turns out um, there's not a known human tumor that arises from microglia. Um, Chris and, and Nicole know, know well, and I've been challenged with, well, what, a, what about Langerhans cell histocytosis, which is a very rare disease, um, where you can have CNS involvement, and it's associated with myeloid cells. But um, my reading of some of the newest data coming out of some of those meetings in Greece is that it seems to be more derived from a definitive hemopoietic stem cell. So unless you genetically modify a mouse to force the microglia to, to be tumorigenic, uh, you don't get tumors from microglia. So how can we apply this to our Alzheimer's work? If you remember, I showed you that we see these very specific responses to plaques. And, and we got to thinking that it'd be nice to be able to regulate the expression of a therapeutic approach. So if we want to go after amyloid, could we regulate so that we only express that anti-amyloid thing when they encounter amyloid? And so we thought, well, let's take advantage of the CD9 promoter to have this exquisite control of delivery of a therapeutic cargo. We did a few experiments with a CAR approach, and we're continuing to do that, and it kind of worked. Um, so an anti-amyloid CAR in a microglia. But actually, when we did a head-to-head -head comparison, we found a different approach that worked even better. Um, and that was to deliver uh, a protein called neprilysin. And this harkens back to some work that I collaborated with Gene on when I was a, a postdoc, um, where um, neprilysin is a known A-beta degrading enzyme. More recently, we found that it's an Alzheimer's GWAS gene. And it looks like reductions in neprilysin expression increase risk of Alzheimer's, and it also decreases with age. Um, so we thought, well, let's pair that neprilysin up with this CD9 promoter to have some specificity. And John Paul, the, the grad student leading this project, um, made two versions of this. He made the full-length membrane-bound neprilysin, and then he made one, uh, a truncated one with a secretion signal, with the idea that maybe secretion will get more, more widespread delivery. So, we did some in vitro validation, but then moved on quite quickly to uh, in vivo transplants. At this point, doing them in young mice, two months, but those of you who've worked with 5X mice know that they've already started to get pathology at that age. They're a very aggressive amyloid model. Um, waited about four and a half months and then examined those brains. And so we had you know, mice getting a, a saline control, we had our wild type controls, and then we had the two versions of the cells delivering neprilysin or secreted neprilysin. I'm sorry, I should say the wild type control is wild type cells into the 5X model. Um, so one of the first things we were able to validate is, is that this CD9 approach does allow us to only turn on the therapeutic gene when they encounter plaques. So the blue is a, a marker for plaques. The, the green is this neprilysin, and the white here is the CD9. And you can see the green and the white overlap very nicely, right? And that's what makes sense. CD9 is driving the neprilysin. The red here is all human nuclei, which are all the microglia. And so you can see they're scattered around, and there's plenty of human microglia that are not expressing this neprilysin. It's just the ones that are adjacent to these plaques that have turned it on and are starting to make the neprilysin. And we can even see that by ELISA and whole brain uh, lysates. We only see the induction in the amyloid model. Um, what does that look like when we look in the brain? Well, we get a, a partial promising reduction in amyloid here in the hippocampus. So a couple different markers for different amyloid states are reduced in the ones receiving neprilysin. We have can do some biochemistry and see that, yeah, there's, there's some decent reductions or, you know, about halfway reduced. There's still some amyloid for sure. Um, there is a reduction in soluble oligomers, which are uh, supposed to be involved in a lot of the synaptic dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease. So it looks promising, but this data is really from the hippocampus where we transplanted the mice. And uh, also when we look in the hippocampus, we actually seem to have some benefits to, to synapses. So, this model and most mouse models of Alzheimer's have a 
fairly subtle reduction in synapses. That's the light pink versus the purple, but it is significant. Um, here looking at synaptivizin and here looking at PST95, so pre and post synaptic markers. Um, but specifically in this case with the secreted neprilysin, we see this rescue or protect, protection back to wild type levels. So it suggests we are able to protect synaptic density in these mice. Um, but there's a problem. Uh, when we transplant these cells into a fully occupied adult niche, we actually can't get that many microglia in there. So this is really probably one of our best examples of an adult unilateral transplant of microglia in green here into a, a fully occupied niche. And so, yeah, we get some pretty good engraftment in the hippocampus, a few in the overlying cortex. Some of them even migrate across the corpus callosum to the other side, but that's about it. The rest of the brain is empty. Um, now, that's a mouse. If we're even going to consider this therapeutically for humans, you know, it's important to remember the size difference between a human brain and a mouse brain. Um, so that presents a problem. We're not going to want to turn a human brain into a pincushion to, to deliver enough of these cells. So we started thinking, well, could we give them an advantage? And there are a number of different drugs that can actually kill mouse microglia. Um, so we thought, well, maybe we can kill off the mouse microglia, give them room, allow the human microglia to engraft. Turns out those drugs have a very close time window. As soon as you take them away, the mouse microglia come roaring back. And one of our first experiments told us that those drugs also kill human microglia. Um, so that didn't work. We had, had to get a little more tricky. Um, and so we actually teamed up with, with Chris Bennett uh, and his grad student Sonia at University of Penn, who were working on something very similar. Um, we discovered uh, from mutual friends about that and decided to, uh, instead of competing, collaborate, which was a lot of fun. I'm glad we went that route. Um, just to try and start to explore this idea that you might be able to take a brain with, say, dysfunctional microglia or ones that are not doing the job, add in a therapeutic cell, but then provide one of these drugs and allow your therapeutic cell to take over. But as I just mentioned, these drugs kill our therapeutic cells too. So how do we allow this? Well, these drugs actually work through blocking CSF1 signaling and CSF1, CSF1R, sorry, signaling. So CSF1R receptor for CSF1 and its other ligand IL-34 is this receptor that is critical for microglial survival. This is the same pathway that I mentioned we had to humanize in the mouse to even get the human cells to survive. And each of these drugs will get into the ATP binding pocket of, of the CSF1 receptor, block that ATP, and that's how it essentially starves the microglia to death. Um, so with a, a colleague, Rob Spitali, who's a biochemist, he said, well, maybe we can make a little point mutation that might uh, change this. So he zoomed into the crystal structure of the, the drugs in that pocket. And there was a glycine there at 795, which has a very small side chain. And he said, well, why don't we give it a little bit bigger side chain, make an alanine or cysteine or a valine, make these three different ones, and see what happens. And so John Paul used CRISPR to make point mutations in our IPS line for each of these. And uh, we differentiated the microglia and then exposed them to these drugs. And so here's our wild type, and this is uh, a marker of apoptosis, so increasing values means more cell death. And there's dose-dependent inductions of cell death when you give these drugs to a wild-type microglia. But this G795A and G795C seem to be resistant to both of these drugs. Now, the valine substitution is not there because we actually couldn't make microglia from the G795V. And that shows that you can get too big and you actually can push the ATP out, too. But we went forward with these other two. And we, of course, wanted to know, had we screwed up the microglia? Had we changed them in some way that could be detrimental? Because that wouldn't be good either. So we did some RNA sequencing. And here the contrast is our wild-type cells treated with the plexicon. Lots of gene expression changes versus the wild-type in the black circles over here, not treated. Whereas the green and the blue are both our treated and untreated versions of the resistant cells. And you can see the, the G795C is a little bit different on PC2, whereas the G795A is really overlapping with the wild type samples and looks very similar. And if we look at the, the correlation at either the whole transcriptome or a microglial signature level, it's, it's very, very strong. Um, if we look at a volcano plot of these differences in the wild type, there's lots of differences as these cells are starting to die. 
Uh, in contrast, no significant differences in G795A and G795C. In fact, when we submitted this paper, uh, one of the reviewers said there was a typo in the printing of the figure because uh, there were no dots on those two graphs. And we had to clarify that, no, that was the point. <laughs> um, so did, how does this work in vivo? We, we could transplant cells into the hippocampus. And remember, in a fully occupied niche, you don't get much engraftment. And that's shown here. We put some cells in, waited about a month. Uh, it's hard to see at this level, but they're a little bit brighter, ibopositive, human right glia, but we can use a human nuclear marker to see them. So just a smattering, just a small number in that hippocampus where we transplanted because it's an occupied niche. But now when we start to treat those mice with this plexicon, we're killing off the mouse cells, but the R cells are resistant, so they can start to proliferate and expand into that niche. So here at 10 days, they're starting to expand out. By 30 days, they're filling a lot of the brain. And you can see this sort of what we call a wave front of proliferative microglia working their way out to this empty space in the cortex. And by two months, the entire brain, and actually all the way down to the lumbar spinal cord, is now 100% populated with human microglia. Um, we've gone on to do different things with duration and dose, and we can actually regulate the amount of engraftment or even target specific areas and only get engraftment in that area with this approach. Um, we, we went on to do RNA sequencing in vivo. Suffice to say, the microglia seem completely unaffected. They respond to strong inflammatory insults appropriately. So we think this mutation allows us to do this without disrupting the normal function of microglia. Um, so how can we apply this to our Alzheimer's questions? Remember I showed you our neprilysin, and we had these promising results, but it was very specific to the hippocampus. Well, we decide decided to pair the two approaches up um, to get this more brain-wide uh, engraftment. And sure enough, not surprisingly, we get a lot more human microglia engrafted in the cells. We also get increased levels of neprilysin in response to that. Um, surprisingly, when we did the biochemistry for amyloid, we didn't see much of a, a difference. Both the treated with, uh, with the plexagon drug or untreated neprilysin cells reduced amyloid pretty equivalently by biochemistry. So that was pretty surprising. And I should say we were using the secreted form here because that had given us the more promising results. Um, but when we look uh, histologically, especially within the cortex, we do see some interesting differences. So obviously the lower one, you see much more Michael and Grafman in green, but also the plaques, you can likely see that there's a lower density, those plaques are also smaller, and they're also more uh, compacted. And remember, microglia, the reason they surround those plaques is to try and compact them and prevent secondary damage. And so we're assessing that now. But you can see there's this nice correlation between the, the sphericity, the, the sort of circular compaction of the plaques, and the number of cells we're getting in when we use this approach. But ultimately, what we really care about is Alzheimer's disease is synapses and you know, other sides of neurodegeneration. And again, there, we see a benefit but an equivalent benefit between the ones that do or don't get the neprilysin. Uh, so PSD95 restored in both cases. Uh, plasma NFL, which is a marker, biomarker, blood biomarker of, of neuronal injury, is equally diminished. So do we need to uh, combine these two? Well, in a mouse, maybe not. In a human, perhaps. Um, you know, plenty more work to do to try and figure that out. So to summarize this, this second part, I, I showed you that we can use things like the CD9 promoter to drive an amyloid uh, uh, targeting approach, such as niprilysin. That can reduce pathology, protect against synapse loss. Uh, and I didn't have time to show you, but there's no detectable off-target effects. So neprilysin can cleave some other proteins, and we check those, and those weren't changed. And we think that's because we're only inducing right near those plaques. Um, we can also then add in this mutation, and that gives us more control of our engraftment in an occupied niche, and I think would allow us potentially to get as many or as few microglia as we want into an adult brain. Uh, and then if we combine the two, sure, we can get better engraftment, higher neprilysin. Debatable whether that's necessary uh, in a mouse. Uh, even more debatable <laughs> if one ever takes us to, to human, but I think it's nice to have those options. Um, so just in the very last minute, I want to just briefly point to, to two other uh, indications that we're starting to think about. Um, this is some work that, that uh, uh, Nicole will recognize this figure. 
Um, it's from her a supplemental from, from uh, Claudia Hahn's recent immunity paper, beautiful paper, um, where they highlight something that a lot of us have known about, but it's, it's so convenient to finally have a good heat map to show this, which is within the brain, if you look at lysosomal enzyme genes, microglia have higher levels of almost all of them than the rest of the brain. And that actually makes sense, microglia phagocytes, so they have very active lysosomes. Um, and so if one's thinking about other diseases where this could apply, being able to deliver a healthy functional lysosome to a kid who has neurological deficits in response to lysosomal storage disorders may be a good approach. And so we're actually just starting to get working on this, and this is a collaboration with, with Johannes and Chris's lab and, and Philip Gortz and Jeff Esco, who are really experts in, in uh, this MPS3A, or San Filippo syndrome as it's called, a childhood disorder in which you get this accumulation of heparin sulfates because of a defect in the lysosomal enzyme that normally degrades them. And what we find is biochemically, there's a partial reduction when we put in just healthy human microglia. And when we look histologically, we find this real dichotomy between where there is or isn't engraftment. So the yellow are human microglia, the red is the lysosomal pathology. So really, where we get engraftment, the pathology is dramatically reduced. Where we don't, we don't. And so we're now, of course, trying to see whether if we increase engraftment with this other approach, whether this will provide further benefits. And then the very last one I want to mention uh, is actually probably uh, a disease that few people have heard of, but is the most logical disease. So there's a disease, and it's a mouthful. It's called adult onset leukoencephalopathy with axonal spheroids and pigmented glia. I'm getting good at doing that fast. Uh, we, we like to call it ALSP, but a lot of people get confused with ALS. Totally different disease. Um, but it's what is considered a primary microgliopathy. What do I mean by that? It's caused by mutations in CSF1R, that same gene that I keep coming back to that's so important for microglial survival. Um, the patients in their about 30s or 40s develop a pretty rapidly progressing uh, dementia, sometimes also accompanied with motor impairments and seizures. And pathologically, there's a number of these axonal spheroids. Uh, they get white matter hyperintensities and thinning of, of white matter tracts. Um, uh, calcification of the brain, astrogliosis, but ultimately what's driving this is a reduction in microglial numbers. So because of these mutations, these patients can't keep up uh, their normal levels of microglia, and that's what's underlying the disease. In fact, there's some rare pediatric forms of this disease where they have homozygous mutations in this. They were born with no microglia, died shortly thereafter, and all of these pathologies were even more exacerbated. So, Turns out we, we think we have a mouse model of this. They're called fire mice. They are a genetic model that lacks microglia. And as they, they seem pretty normal uh, at first, not great breeders, but pretty normal otherwise. But as they start to age, they develop almost all of these ALSP pathologies. So spheroids, uh, uh, gliosis, calcification, changes in white matter. Um, and so we've been asking, can we transplant a healthy microglia in this mouse, and can we have some benefits in terms of these pathologies? And we've also been asking, is this amenable to an autologous approach? So could we take a patient's cell, make an IPS, fix that mutation, give them microglia back in? That would be the ideal scenario, not have to worry about immune suppression, et cetera. Um, and so we've started to do a variety of these, making an IPS cell from a patient carrying this mutation, CRISPR editing to repair that mutation, uh, validating that actually in vitro, and not surprisingly, that mutation impairs the proliferation of microglia, but if we correct it with CRISPR, we recover that proliferation, and then transplanting them into this mouse model of four months of age. And essentially what we find is that the CRISPR-corrected cells pretty much rescue all of the pathologies but the uncorrected ones don't. And the uncorrected ones have this massive deficit in proliferation and, and in graphene and migration. You can see both of these were injected with the exact same number of cells in the hippocampus, uh, and this is a few weeks later. The corrected ones have filled that whole brain niche, and the uncorrected ones are just stuck in a few places. And as a result, the calcification is reduced in the corrected one, but not in the uncorrected. Likewise, similar with the gliosis and also similar with these axonal spheroids. And one thing that's quite interesting is 
The, the light green is the amount of pathology at the time of transplant, and the dark green is what they look like six weeks later after transplant. And so we're actually reducing some of this existing pathology, which is encouraging. So with that, I've gone on and on, but uh, obviously you can tell these are uh, experiments I'm quite excited about, uh, but couldn't have been done without some really fabulous students and postdocs and technicians in the lab, uh, great collaborators at UCI, uh, at Penn, a number of fantastic collaborators here at San Diego, including Chris and Nicole, um, and Gene for a lot of advice over the years, and of course our funding. So if there is time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, with the TREM2 knockout microglia, so you showed in vivo with the transplants that there was a reduction in dams. Do you see that in vitro as well? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't have time to go into it, but some of that single cell seek is essentially showing that. That's the data Chris and I are going to talk about <laughs> shortly. Um, so yes, in vitro. Even without a challenge, even with baseline, they have lower levels of, of dams, but if you give them a challenge, it's a more dramatic difference. So um, on, on some of those where you, uh, where you have the therapeutic uh, microglia on the CD9 uh, mm -hmm. neurophysin driven uh, gene, have you considered uh, driving other genes with the same promoter? Yeah, uh, absolutely, for Alzheimer's. Yeah. Yeah, for Alzheimer's, I think CD9 is a great promoter. We know it's also specific in human cases for, for uh, that microglial response. So we have another sort of parallel study with a, a CAR approach, so chimeric antigen receptor, where we have a single-chain antibody against amyloid paired up with a signaling domain. And it turns out the CAR approaches that have been developed in CAR T cells, if you put them in a macrophage, they actually induce phagocytosis, the same exact um, uh, design. And so in vitro, that seems to work. We increase phagocytosis of amyloid very specifically. We're just about to sacrifice those animals and take a look. But I should say in vitro, we actually did a comparison to the neprilysin, and while it significantly reduced it, the neprilysin was about two times uh, better, I think, because it kind of cuts it up and makes it easier to digest. Yeah. Okay. We have a question on, on Zoom. First of all, the uh, questioner said, great talk. Matt, exciting work, as always. Can you share your thoughts on some of the alternative peripheral macrophage <laughs> microglial replacement approaches and how they may compare to IPS microglial re uh, transplantation? I love that question. Now I'm wondering if that's someone from my lab. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'll take the opportunity to very quickly show a couple backup slides here. So there, there is this, It was a plant. <laughs> it probably was. It probably was. <laughs> I didn't ask for it, but I'll take it. Um, so there have been a number of studies looking at, at could you use a bone marrow transplantation approach this way, right? Uh, could you get those monocytes to infiltrate the brain? Um, and there are experiments in mice suggesting that if you combine that with those plexicon drugs, monocytes from the periphery are actually more resistant to that drug, and you can get pretty high in graphene in the brain. But these ex same experiments that have, you know, really compelling, exciting titles uh, go on to spend two-thirds of their data showing that those cells never become microglia. So transcriptionally, they're quite distinct. More importantly, functionally, they're distinct. And among the things that a peripheral myeloid cell is much better at doing is phagocytosis. And by that, I mean phagocytosis of pretty much anything, including synapses. So I don't think it's probably a good approach. And I'll just say that those studies have been done in mice, but we've been using this mouse model that allows us to uh, transplant human monocytes versus microglia, and we're seeing the same thing. These monocytes have highly pro-inflammatory gene expression that persists regardless. That, in turn, leads to chronically elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines that you can detect not only in the brain, but even the plasma. So I don't think uh, if you did achieve high engraftment of monocytes in the brain, it would be all that good. You might fix one problem and cause a whole new problem. Thanks, so, plant, whoever that was. <laughs> <laughs> so that speaks against perhaps bone marrow transplantation as a therapy think, for some I of think, these diseases. Yeah, yeah. Now, that said, there, there are some trials looking promising for some lysosomal storage diseases with bone marrow transplant, but what we really don't know about is how much of that is through peripheral effects versus actually infiltration. The best data on how many of those cells get in the brain is 5% in humans, right. and in mice it's even lower. So we don't know the mechanism yet. Chris? Uh, 
So thanks for the great talk. Okay. Uh, oh. So you were uh, showing how the transcriptomic profile of the in vitro IPS dry microglia is different mm -hmm. than the ex vivo one, yep. uh, which is what like you know we all want to have like better in vitro models. Mm -hmm. And but having a model in vitro is useful for like drug screening and what we want. So yep. I was wondering if you know like you, you, you what do you think about Light what the transcriptomic profile will be when micro IPS dry microglia is mixed with other cell culture with other cell yeah. types like yeah. neurons and astrocytes or if there is any other factors you're considering to make it like closer to the ex vivo one yeah f fantastic question a, a really important question we've done some work on that i think uh, nicole and chris have done some work on that too so um the short answer is yes if you co-culture them with neurons they'll become a little more brain-like even astrocytes will do that you put them in organoids maybe a little more but none of it reaches the level we get in, in with the mouse transplant so far. But you know the way I think you're alluding to is we have all this gene expression data. We can look at the transcription factors implicated in those differences and think, are there ways to induce those transcription factors? And that's some of the work that some of us have done. Chris has done elegant work on this, this transcription factor, SAL1, which is one of the big differences between ex, uh, in vitro and in vivo microglia. And I think all three of us have tried to overexpress it, and it's a, a nightmare to try and just overexpress it. So if we can find other ways to induce that and maybe some other transcription factors, I think that would make those models even better. Yeah. A question coming in from the Zoom. Uh, have some autophagy upregulators, probably known drugs that regulate mTOR or TFEB pathways, been specifically used on IMGLs from AD patients? And if yes, do they show any signs of any recovery? Uh, great question. I'm not aware of people testing that yet, but I think it's a, it's a really good idea because autophagy, a lot of the genes involved in autophagy are also involved in phagocytosis, and there's this overlap. And there's more and more evidence that there's an energetic problem in microglia and Alzheimer's disease. And obviously, aut autophagy ties into an mTOR ties into energetics. So it's a great experiment. Someone should do it. <laughs> but I, I'm not aware of anyone having published that yet. Angela? Uh, so you, at the beginning of your talk, you talked about the HLA association of uh, Alzheimer's and other diseases, mm -hmm. right? So I was just, that's, that really suggests a T cell involvement. Mm. Is this something that kicks in only at the end when yeah. the, or is it, does it uh, work at the beginning? Yeah, also fantastic question. So this is one of the caveats to this model. It's genetically immune deficient, so we have no T cells to look at here. Uh, which is why we, we also do studies with traditional mouse models to look at at least mouse T cells. And yes, we, other people, there's publications showing that in the mouse models, there is some T cell infiltration. Um, it tends to be associated a little more with tau pathology, and it tends to come quite late once there's cell loss. Um, but beautiful work from Dave Holtzman, for example, has shown that if you block that T cell infiltration, you can reduce some of the pathological outcomes in, in neurodegeneration. So it may be contributing. It seems to be primarily CD8s, not CD4s, which is, is quite interesting. In humans, the data is getting better. And yes, there are increased CD8s, at least detectable in the CSF of Alzheimer's versus controls. There's some clonality of the TCRs. And people, of course, are trying to figure out what that's against. But it's kind of on the low end and maybe an, and really on the more severe cases. So my hunch is it's coming a little bit later. But I think at least one of the mechanisms that I know a lot of people are exploring is T cells can interact with microglia on multiple fronts. Microglia can present antigen quite well, and they upregulate MHCs quite nicely. So they may be presenting, and if so, what antigen would be really interesting. But the other thing is that cytokines, chemokines from T cells can alter microglial function uh, and change their activation state. So I think there's a lot more to be discovered there, and it's going to be important. And this is my pet peeve about this model, although I don't know any of you, you study hemopoietic biology, a beautiful paper just came out in cell stem cells. Someone's finally figured out how to make a definitive hemopoietic stem cell from an IPS. So now we can hopefully make those. <laughs> oh, no, you don't? <laughs> I thought it was beautiful. I'd love to talk to you and hear the real scoop, because I'm not a... <laughs> it would much, be much simpler just to put T cells back. <laughs> so, back yeah, but I want, I, we need to match them to, to that patient, which we could, we could potentially do by getting PBMCs, but yeah. Okay, a we'll question. I'll you later. I want to hear your scoop. Different groups of 
Oh, okay. I know a second group that, that's got to buy archives that looks good, too. So. <laughs> uh, another question on the Zoom. Is there a human trial using CRISPR to treat ALSP? Uh, not yet. <laughs> Maybe, hopefully, uh, in, in two, three years, we're, we're working towards that. It's a very logical disease as the first indication to try and do this in, but, but not yet. All right. And this is a double-barreled question. Uh, are there any downsides to having such extensive microglial engraftment? Mm -hmm. And the second part is, what really are the microglia doing? Is, is there therapeutic action, lysosomal enzymes, and diffusible factors, or phagocytosis, or do you know that level of mechanism? Yeah, well, so I'll take the second part. I, I think the second part, the answer is all of the above. They're probably doing a mixture of things. I mean, we like to try and point towards one specific mechanism, and it's almost always more than one. Um, so, and I think it, the second thing is also very dependent on the indication. So in the case of the ALSP data, Yes, I think they're just clearing those spheroids. Um, but they also are reducing astrocytosis, and so that may be through cytokine uh, effects. So I think they can do a lot of, a lot of different things, and it's going to depend on the disease. The first part of the question in terms of is there a downside, yes, I'm sure. Every drug has side <laughs> effects, no doubt. Uh, there could be side effects to um, putting in microglia into people. I think one of the important things is this turnover I don't think we'd want to do it in two months in a human. <laughs> I think you'd want to dose this to very gradually turn things over because you wouldn't want to just wipe out all their existing microglia and then wait another six months for the new ones to come in. You'd want to give a competitive edge to the protective cells. Even then, uh, there could be uh, things that we can't quite predict uh, about putting in a cell um, that, that is responsive to pathology, right? Could it potentially get too activated? Um, so I think it's like any cell therapy, we won't really know how it's going to work in a human until someone tries it in a human. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was just super curious um, about the applications of this, like beyond like microglial replacement therapies. Um, just because I know the tools that you used for your uh, G795A are also kind of used in oncology to predict mm -hmm. like tumor resistance, and I was yeah. wondering if you could please speak more on that. Yeah, no, I think that kind of approach could be developed for a lot of different cells, right? I mean, and yeah, we didn't come out of it. Come, come up with it out of the blue. Oncology has developed ways to make cells more sensitive or less sensitive to chemotherapeutics, for example. Um, and so, yes, I think for any given cell type, we might be able to develop, figure out what are the key things that keep that cell happy and alive and functioning the way you want it and be able to manipulate it and, and change things over. Now, for some cells, we're not going to want to do that. We're not going to want to do that with neurons, right? Because Neurons are not going to reconnect appropriately. Um, but certainly in the periphery of the cells, I think there's a lot of opportunity for that kind of approach. I wonder if you ever tried any of the pathological human uh, initial cells, in particular the early onset Alzheimer's, yeah. people in their 40s, and maybe also try to get a handle on the question of why there's sometimes people that have a lot of amyloid beta, but no dementia, <laughs> and other people that have dementia and no amyloid beta. Yeah. This is a very much ongoing question here, Yep. and I'm hoping that maybe what you're doing with micro, microglia could shed some light on it. Yeah, both fantastic questions. So, so the first one, we have not done that yet, but other people are starting to look at, for example, presenolin mutations, one of the causes of familial onset Alzheimer's disease, which is expressed in microglia and actually cleaves a whole bunch of important microglial proteins, including TREM2. And there's some evidence that, that it's expressed decently in microglia and probably having effects on microglial function in those patients. So it could be part of the, part of the story. The field is focused on neuronal a beta production, but those presynomial mutations are going to change my clear. Um, the the um, second second part, um, sorry, I blanked. The second part was, remind me again. Oh, the tau connection, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I can't believe I blanked on that because that's one of my favorite questions, actually. So, so uh, yes, there are plenty of people who develop amyloid but never develop tau, and typically they're the ones that don't develop dementia. 
Um, and my hypothesis, and it's not just me, a lot of people think that the connection between amyloid and tau involves microglia. So we know in animal models, when you have increasing amyloid and you have tau, the amyloid will increase the tau pathology. We know in Down syndrome, amyloid comes 10 years before tau pathology, and they've got an extra copy of, of APP. Um, and we know that microglia are kind of in the cascade events, full summer in there. So I think microglia can, not surprisingly, have good and bad effects. So they can have good effects in perhaps restraining that amyloid pathology, but if they get too chronically pro-inflammatory, they start to make things like IL-1 beta and TNF-alpha. And those pro-inflammatory cytokines have actually been shown to increase tau kinases that increase tau phosphorylation. So that's just one example of a potential link between the two. Um, so I think there's a lot to learn. We're actually about to embark on a study of a, a very rare gene uh, called the Christchurch variant of APOE, which was in a patient who had one of these familial mutations where she should have developed Alzheimer's in her 30s, and she lived to her like mid-70s without Alzheimer's. They looked in the brain, she had plaques but not tangles, so then they sequenced a number of her genes and they found a variant in APOE that we didn't know about before that we're pretty sure is what's driving that protection. And a paper just came out yesterday in a mouse model suggesting that the link is that that is affecting the amyloid to tau transition. So that's an example, and I think if we can shut that down, it's, it's going to be a great therapeutic target. Yeah, I think uh, you already discussed in the last um, portion of your comment, uh, earlier comment, about mm -hmm. what I wanted to ask. Mainly, this uh, dual edged uh, zo sort kind of situation where you want sustained expression of this microglia and the uh, payload in, uh, um, it carries, but at the same time, sustained expression can lead to yep. inflammatory situation, yep. and even in, during transplantation itself, you can have cytokine storm and things like that because it's a, these are basically immune cells yep. as well. So how do you tackle this in a therapeutic? I can totally understand in terms of mm. microgliopathies, but in AD, which yeah. is a chronic disease, how we are planning to uh, tackle this? Yeah, uh, excellent question. I actually don't think one would want constitutive delivery of, of that, and that's why we use that CD9 promoter, and I didn't get into it, but we actually find that as the amyloid comes down, it turns off. So it self-regulates. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing we need, is to take advantage of that. Microglia can change their state in response to the changing pathology. So if you engineer microglia to address the pathology properly, you do want to turn it back off again. And so finding the right promoter for a given disease to do that, and, and the, in this case, CD9 looks like a promising one for amyloid, there'll be a different one for tau pathology, a different one for a different disease. But I do think we want that regulated ability to not have this chronic thing, because I think that would lead to the problems. Okay, with, with that, I think we should thank Matt for a fantastically stimulating talk. Thank Nicole for and uh, wish you all a happy holiday season, a happy new year. Uh, be safe, be productive, and we'll see you back in 2024. Thank you. <laughs>